because my nature has been changed by Jesus. So on one side, his love, we learn that, right? Uh, constrains us, forces us to know that Christ died for all. When he died, we also died with him. So he gave up his life for us. So he gave his love for us. And when we understand the sacrifice and the suffering he went through to show us that love, and we experience that love, that we no longer live our life for ourselves, but we live our life unto God. So now our life living unto God is not because I want to, but because his love that is in us is what makes us go out of our way to reach out to others. As the mother experiences love, that same mother before marriage would have been a lazy mother. Or the mother, the mother would have told the daughter, go and put this garbage into the bin. And the daughter would say, yeah, I'm not going to touch it, she. But once she gets married, now she gets a baby. Now what happens to the langoti? What happened to the vomiting? What happened to the susu and the kaka? The same girl who was saying she is now doing everything for the baby, but now she doesn't find anything dirty. Did that happen to you, Baba? You are also saying she, she? And now when the baby came, did you say she, she? Ah, that is because of love. So having experienced the grace, which is a free gift to all of us, and also giving us the power to understand this grace, which is invisible, which cannot be felt with our senses, but God showed it us through Christ. Has anybody seen Christ? But we believe because it's the written word of God. And the power to believe comes from God. So grace comes from God. Faith also comes from God. And all that we are doing is now putting it into action. And that action and that labor also is not ours. It is His. Praise God. So, write down. Because... Salvation is a gift. Salvation is a gift. And roots, and roots, not in the merit of man, but in the mercy of God. Not in the goodness of man, roots not in the mercy of man, not in the merit of man, but in the mercy of God, and not in the goodness of man. But in the grace of God, does that mean, does that mean, therefore, that it makes no difference that it makes no difference how we live. Give me Romans 6, verse 1. Make no difference how we live. 
how we live. Look over here. Dead to sin, alive to. But in our personal life, what is there? Alive to sin, dead to God. So, what took place on the cross is an exchange that we who were alive to sin, Jesus took that sin into his body and he died because of our sin. Because only a person who commits sin can die. So he had committed no sin. So he could never die. But because he took our sin, he qualified death. Is that clear? So, Jesus died our death. And when we see our life, it is purely the mercy of God that we got forgiven. Because without mercy, we cannot be forgiven. We need to be punished for the wrongs that we did. So it is not the goodness of man that he, we are blessed, but it is because of grace of God that we are blessed. So he is saying, if I believe that Jesus died for me, Because of his mercy, we are forgiven. And because of his grace, we are blessed. So we got two things. Mercy and grace. Now that we have got the new nature of Christ, what shall we say then? Shall we continue? Are we forgiven? Yes. Has mercy cancelled all the punishment? Yes. Now that you are forgiven, now, do I want to continue my life to live in sin? Because when sin increased, grace increased even more. So, I have got now grace. I have got now freedom. I have now got a new nature of God. So, can I use my new life to grow in sin. That's what it is. And then he says, God, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? I must believe that my old nature, which was drawing me to sin, my self centeredness, which was drawing me to sin has been put to death. Has anybody ever committed sin? Yes. What is the root of every sin? Hmm? No, no, I did not say what is the effect of sin. What is the root of every sin? Sorry? Desire, okay. Unbelief, okay. Huh? Selfishness or self centeredness. So, what did Christ do? He was also a human being. Now, did Jesus live his life for self or did he live his life for God? So, because he lived his life for God, he became my substitute and he paid the penalty for me. How many of us would like to pay the penalty of punishment for somebody else? So, what did Jesus do? He paid a penalty. So, let, let me give you an example. Adam is there and Jesus is there. Who ate the fruit first? Eve. 
did she pluck that fruit and come and give it to Adam? Yes. Was there a bite? Yes. That means she has disobeyed. So he would have gone and told Adam, I ate this fruit, you also can take it. What do you think Adam would have said? Zivya, what do you think Adam would have said? He knows his wife is going to die according to what God said. Anisha, what do you think Adam would have said when he knows his wife has taken poison? Aplukh ne ek duje ke le picha deka? See, when the wife, when the girl was not given a chance to get married to that boy, what did the girl say? I will die, but I will not get married to any other man because I love you. What did the boy say? Even I will not get married to any girl because I love you. So what did they both decide? To jump and die. So might be, might be, I think so, might be, that Adam would have said, I love you and I can't live without you. Anyway, you have eaten the fruit and you are dying. I will also eat the fruit and I'll die with you. Possible? Possible? Now there came another story. Jesus also is in the garden. But the garden is different. One is the Garden of Eden, everything in abundance. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. His bride, that is you and I, we have all eaten the forbidden fruit and we are already sinners. So, what do you think Jesus would have said? No. What no? I will not die, you die. You know what Jesus would have said? He would have said to Eve, all of us, I love you so much. But I got an idea. I will not eat the fruit and die with you. But I will take your place and die instead of you so that I will die and you can live. So you can have my life and I will take your death because I love you. That's love. So he would have said, I will become your substitute. I will become your representative. I will set you free from sin and the consequences of sin and I'll give you my life. So that now you don't have to be a slave to sin but you can live my life forever. How shall we that are dead to sin? He took my sin, my punishment and everything. Can I live now in that old life or with a new life? I will live a new life. So if you understand the kind of love that he practically lived by becoming a substitute and the intensity of suffering that he went through, now, okay, I, I, I remember an incident. Can I share with you? This is a story. The ship was sinking and there was only one lifeboat. And there was a husband and wife. 
okay? And the choice had to be made. Before the choice could be made, the husband pushed his wife behind and he jumped into the lifeboat and left. What would you call that? The life, wife was left behind so that the boat, the ship would sink and she would sink in that. The man pushed the wife, jumped into the lifeboat and moved out. And the wife looked at him and said, thank you very much, take care of the children. She was suffering from cancer. Now if you see in the natural, what looks like? The man has been selfish. Correct? And the wife is saying, thank you very much for pushing me out and you taking the responsibility of the children, take care of the children. Because I'm anyway going to die after two weeks. But thank you for making the choice, not for our sake, but for the children's sake, you made that difficult choice. I thank you for that. Hello. Did the man think about the wife? Yes. Did the wife think about the man? Yes. But in both this, what was the decision? Their lives or the children's life? Praise God. So when you see with your natural eyes, and when you see what was the reason why this person did, are you understanding? So when you look at Jesus pushing you into the lifeboat and he dying in a place. So that he says, when I die, my life, I will give you. And your death, and your cancer, and your sickness, and your disease, I will take it as an exchange with me and die. But I will see to it that you get my life so that you can live for eternity. That's what happened on the cross. How come you're not asking me any question? Sorry? Okay. Write down. Romans 6, 1, 2 says any Christian saved by grace any Christian saved by grace who continues to live a life of sin who continues to live a life of sin any person any Christian saved by grace who continues to live a life of sin is a disgrace to grace is a disgrace to grace. Now what happens, um, what might have happened to John the Baptist? Let's take an example. Was, was John the Baptist a man of God? A prophet of God? Did he work really hard to bring people to repentance? Were the people listening to what he said and repented. Was he baptizing them in the water? Praise God. Then how come John the Baptist got offended with Jesus? 
did John the Baptist perform any miracle? Absolutely zero miracle. But did the people follow him? What is pre was his preaching extremely strong that people came to change their life? Then how come, oh, okay, one more. Did John the Baptist lead his disciples to go after Jesus? Would you like to, uh, would you like to lead who are with you after some other ministry? Even if, even if she, she says, I'm going to some, you can go but never come back again. What, what is the attitude? Hello, what is the attitude? But the real person is John the Baptist who is saying, I am on this level. But the person who I am sending you to is on the highest level. I am not even fit to tie his sandals. So he sent them after Jesus. Now, John the Baptist is arrested and put in the prison. And he gets news in the prison. Jesus is talking about love. He is talking about forgiveness. And John the Baptist has gathered the people to revolt against the Romans. Now, instead of getting the army ready, what is Jesus building a new army called love? Come on, Jesus. I gave you the whole thousands and thousands and I told them, follow him. And you, instead of building the army to fight against the Romans, you are talking about love? Where are your weapons, Jesus? Now, did John the Baptist get offended? Why? He labored all that, preparing the way of the Lord, and now he finds the Lord, instead of being in a fighting mood, is in a love mood. Hmm? Who's unbelief? What was he not believing? <laughs> See, John the Baptist has a mindset that Jesus will establish his kingdom and overthrow the Romans. He did not understand Jesus had come for a kingdom which is going to build forever a war against Satan. Did Jesus fight the war against Satan? Come on. Did he defeat him or destroy him? Did Jesus destroy Satan or defeat Satan? Defeated. 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 Did not destroy. Defeated. So if you are defeated, you will come for the match again? Uh, destroyed? destroyed. I, 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 am I confusing all of you? I know I am confusing you. Jesus never destroyed Satan, but he defeated Satan. Why do you think he did not destroy? Why he did not destroy? Brendan, I can ask your wife some questions. Should I go and ask your wife some questions? Okay. If he had to destroy Satan, would there be any more temptation? No. no. So would you have any reason to love God? Yes. See, see, your love for your spouse is because you got options. If there are no options, is there love? For example, Brandon was the only man on this earth. No other person. All ladies now what would have happened to you? <laughs> no option. So she's saying, I love you. What love meant? There's no option only. <laughs> but now she has got plenty of men. And she's saying, Brendan, I choose you only. So there are options. So in the same way, Jesus defeated Satan. 
but he still kept an option open for us that you are saying jesus because i love you i will no longer live my life for myself i will live my life for you praise god because if he doesn't give options then you are just a robot now if she goes and tells her spouse i love you he says i know no option but now she is saying out of all the options i choose you is there a difference between the two yeah here yeah, tell me tell me about this this is very interesting who who really you read that in the bible ah you saw the picture hallelujah, hallelujah. then jesus do would not have to die on the cross see see one thing who died on the cross and how did he win the match if you and i are in the boxing match okay and i punched you and you died who won the match you yeah. now in between satan and jesus who died so who won the match eh kya yaar ho gaya ho gaya because his father was a referee so how did jesus win okay okay no 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 i was just joking don't take it seriously others they'll say that brother was saying that jesus his father was referee that's why satan out jesus not out <laughs> hey hey listen to the whole thing other somebody will take the video clip of that much only and put it across that i'm talking this praise god okay okay how did adam lose the match this obedience how did jesus win now by his grace he made you qualified so that you win now having one do you want to go back to your old life living a defeated life do you want to go back to slavery no or do you want to live a victorious life so are we under grace now all of us but is the devil still going to come with his lies but when adam disobeyed did man have the power to say no to satan no because man had lost the authority because of adam and man was a slave but now we have been set free from slavery and we have been given the authority of christ now can i tell satan back off yes but are we using that authority or are we still eating the lies of the devil so we have been given the choice but if i surely believe that grace has set me free then why should i go back and live the old life of misery when i can live a victorious life clear hello clear yes praise god one man disobeyed the whole human race became sinners one man another man obeyed the whole human race was made righteous but but there is one condition jesus finished on the cross and declared all of us righteous but for me to receive that righteousness i must believe in that sacrifice is that clear so right now very very important uh, uh, very very important after we are saved by the grace of god after we are saved by the grace of god 
we need to learn underline that word learn we need to learn to live in victory we need to we need to learn to live in victory so what is our life now every day what is the life every day to learn so when we learn from the scriptures we are changing our thinking let me give you an example anisha totally how many years back you became a christian 2008 or oh, no your husband has come i can't ask you what a right time when you they entry i just asked you the first question he comes in <laughs> now what do i do should, should, to defend <laughs> now what do i do can i ask should i ask okay 2008 you became a christian you learned your prayers you got baptized you got everything now you got a baby and the baby is crying okay you did everything in the natural to pacify the baby but today if the baby is crying what would you do only speak the word and rebuke rebuke that affliction now why you were not doing before did you have? because i did not have the knowledge of my authority in christ i suffered all these years but now when i heard when i heard i had to learn to believe yeah hey one minute one minute you just give the mic sorry ha huh? no problem Yeah, God. tell us. Praise God. Praise God. Uh, I was converted in 2008. When I heard. Listen carefully. Yeah, today she is living a victorious life. Now, even though she was converted, how come she did not live a victorious life? Okay, 2008, I was converted. Yeah, and then uh, I was living a normal Christian life. Uh, what do you mean by normal Christian <laughs> life? You are living like, an abnormal Christian okay, life. Okay, I will explain. Hey, wait, I don't, I, will, I don't agree with this. You are actually <laughs> living an explain. abnormal <laughs> Christian life. Now you are living the normal Christian life. Yeah. Now okay. I am living a supernatural life okay, in Christ Jesus. Okay, okay. Okay, but Then, did not know the truth of the Word of God like like how I know today. So last year in 2023, my baby was. Uh, one year one year, one year three four months like that in last september when i first attended the retreat in uh, august in uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 brandon come come brandon is saying let's see the lady also thank you brandon yeah okay thank you jesus yeah so uh, in the beginning when i did not have the knowledge of the word of god we will i was like didn't know that how to confess did not know the authority in a way and then when baby was one year one and a half year all that year since she was born every night she was crying every how did i know that <laughs> of all of you sitting why should i ask her about a baby crying i never knew that god knows it yeah god, come Praise come god. come yeah so whole night she was crying the moment i used to put her to sleep and we bought her that uh, cot for the baby uh, cot so we used to put her there when she was born and first month second month third month whole year till i got to know the truth every night she was crying and, and what was he doing <laughs> ah, he, he had to go to, no, no he had to go to work no night time how he will go work no no but morning he has to go to work no yeah, so he has to sleep at night that was how he lived <laughs> and that was the covid uh, time also like no much work also everybody was in the house okay so it was in uh, 
2020, so a whole that year. And then whole night she was crying, like she used to, I, I used to put her to sleep. Within one hour, she used to get up and cry until I hold her and then for... Was it for the milk? No, she used to just cry. Even and, after drinking milk? Yeah, Arriba. and then she used to cry, cry, cry and then whole day tired, night also could not sleep. The moment I put her to sleep and go back to sleep again, within 20 minutes she used to get up and cry again. So you did not tell him, let's go to Mother Teresa's. She's troubling me. Was it the first baby? Yeah. She's troubling me. I can't take it anymore. So let's go there. And most of the nights we used to fight. Because of that only. Like you cannot get up, you cannot hold Hey brother, her. this was not my intention. Huh? <laughs> See, everything you say, be careful what you say. This is the truth. Ah, this. <laughs> okay, okay. What happened? Okay. And then, till I got to know the, my authority in Christ Jesus. Then whole night, I, irritation, No, you were saying you anger. came for the first time for the retreat. Yeah, at that time she was one year, three months. Okay. And this was like she was three months, four months, five months. Not even okay. one year. And whole year went like that only. And then last year when I attended first time for the retreat in Emerald Lawn, then slowly, slowly I began to understand the word. Then the journey started. Then I came to Nalyati for 10 days. I stayed there, understood the word, continued in the word. And then... So you are Nalyati product? First Emerald two, three times. Emerald Lawn is just like that. But yeah. real product is Nalyati yeah, 10 days. Oh, the last, total, total. last um, uh, third month, last 10 days. Like, okay, okay, okay. Then... Uh, when, when I understood the word of God that life and death is in the power of our tongue and then I have to speak, God has given us the authority, Mark 11, 23 and 24, speak to the mountain and when after that when she is to cry, I have to say the word, that spirit of the Lord is upon my baby and then we started to see the result and every night when she, the moment she is to go to sleep, I have to speak the word by taking her name and same, the, the authority, the, the rights, what we are uh, received in our inheritance in Christ Jesus, we started to practice and we saw the results. Praise okay, God. now my question. Okay. You saw the result now. Yeah. Why you are you here? Now your baby is not crying now. Yeah. Then why are you here? This is the love of God. We can't leave him now. <laughs> see, see. Thank you, Jesus. See, that's what I said. How shall we that are dead to sin? Yeah. That we will still live in that same selfishness or having received this love of Christ, I now want to stand here and tell every father, every mother who is going through this, why do you want to fight with each other? Because the fight is not between you and you each other or your baby. The fight is spiritual. So having learned this secret, I want to come and share again and again with everybody that they also have peaceful night. The husband is very happy. Yeah. The wife is very happy. And the baby is super happy. What was a problem? Now, they not only came out of problem, but they got the revelation and now this baby, what do you think this baby would be growing in? <coughs> Fighting atmosphere? Or war against the flesh atmosphere? No problem, no problem. It, do you understand? So what looked like a problem became a turning point to learn the truth and what was a crisis now became a beautiful time in their life that changed the crisis into a great miracle. So crisis will surely come. But when crisis come, it is very important to learn. Now my quick question, even if you are there, no problem. Did you go around asking everybody pray for me? Tell me honestly. Before? Before? Oh, you did not even know, no? That there is a system called pray for me. Lavla ho gaya. So you are knowing your problem, you only solve. But she did not know pray for me. Otherwise, she would also be in the queue. Pray for me. 
But which one was better that she learned herself or keep saying pray for me? So to live a victorious life, do you need to keep asking everybody pray for me? Or it is very important for me to learn how to live victorious. Can you please tell your neighbor, learn? Can you say to her again? Can you say to her again nicely? What is she saying? Yes? No, no, not smile. Ask her. Learn? So, are you going to learn? Are you going to be continuing? Please pray for me. I am not saying it is not bad to ask people to pray for you. But always remember, even if somebody is praying for you, it is only a jump start. You got to learn the system. What did she say? When I came to know that I have the authority in Christ, with my words, I can bring life and I can bring death. When I learned this truth, I began to take authority and I also slept, my husband also slept. Now there are no fights, no? No fights, praise God, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And, the, and is the baby happy now? Praise God. So, do I need to learn? Or is it going to be, you pray over me and automatically I will get the answer? Do you parents tell your children, learn? In your, when they are going for exams, do you parents tell your children, learn, learn, learn? Why are you telling learn? When the question paper comes, they have to reply the right answer. And when they get the right answer and they come with 92, 95, how happy you are. Correct? Are you happy or are you sad because you, the baby lost five marks? Nowadays mothers, our time when you used to get 60, peda bhatta tha. Mera bete ko first class mila bhai. Nowadays, when the baby gets 90, 95, so they will say, what happened to that 5 marks? Why did you lose that 5 marks? Praise God. And what if the baby has to ask mommy, how much did you get? <laughs> Hallelujah. So write down. Do we need to learn? Yes. Clear? Yes. Sure? Yes. The quicker you learn, the quicker you rise. So keep learning, keep practicing, keep training, disciplining, but keep learning. Right? The grace of God, the grace of God, is an anointing, is an anointing, Empowerment to live a godly life. And it also supplies, and it also supplies the power to live a godly life. Can I borrow your chutney for two minutes? I'll give it back. I will not destroy it. Sit up, sit up, sit up, sit up, sit up, sit up, sit up. It's nicely ironed. <laughs> Smelling also good. <laughs> nice perfume. I know no perfume. Can I open it? Now, now watch this, I'm going to share with you what is grace. 
this chuni, if I leave it here, it is here. But the same chuni, if I put it under my arm, and I can say, chuni, go up, go behind, come in front. Now, who is doing all this? Can you see it? So is the grace of God in us. So is the promise of God in us. And this promise is in a word form. But when I take that word and change my thinking to that word, there is not only the word, but also the power of God. So, grace is what Christ has already finished for me on the cross and it is waiting to be inherited. For example, your father and mother worked hard and had a big property. When they died, they could not take the property. So they left the property for you. But do you need to prove yourself and to the government that you are the rightful heir of that inheritance? So you go to the government office, present the death certificate, the documents that are needed, register it, now the property is transferred into your name. In the same way, all that Jesus earned by obedience is now transferred in your name, which is called the grace of God. So I did not sweat to get grace, but it was his love that gave me the grace. So grace is God giving me his power, his ability, everything of his to be used by me. But very good reason, not because of my goodness, even though I don't deserve it, he still gives it to me. It's called grace. Grace is never given to a student who passed. Grace is given to the student who failed. And the good news is, Every one of us have failed when it comes to obeying the law. We all fail. So grace is available to all of us. And because of this grace, I can overcome my old sinful life and learn to live a victorious life. So praise God. We have been given the freedom, but at the same time, we are also given the mercy that forgives us and at the same time given to us the grace that helps us to live a godly life and empowered to live that godly life. So one is the word of God that is changing me to think on godly life and second, the grace of God gives me the power to live a godly life. Now what about the person who did not know Jesus? He has a desire to live a godly life, but he doesn't have the power to live a godly life. Can you understand the difference? I want to live good, but I end up doing the evil that I hate to do. Because there is a dictator living inside of me who has made me a slave in my own body and using this body for sinful purpose. But, I find a person named Jesus. When I receive him in my life, he is the one who takes over the ownership of my life and helps me, empowers me, gives me the grace to say no to Satan and Satan has to obey me because by grace, he has given me the power of attorney to live this life victorious. Praise God. Okay, write down. Okay, we'll go here and then we'll write down. 6-3.
नो यू नॉट नो यू सो देर आर मेनी थिंग्स दैट वी आर सपोज टू इनहेरिट अकॉर्डिंग टू द स्क्रिप्चर्स एंड वी डू नॉट नो इट लेट मी गिव एन एग्जाम्पल दिस प्लेस बिलोंग्स टू अ पर्सन and when i met him in uk he said having seen the videos on youtube my life changed and i and my wife decided that anyway this house is locked only when we come it is open so we have decided why not give this house to you without rent so that you can use this house and preach the gospel okay now was that person interested in the money or was that person interested in the souls getting saved so that person gave me this place and now does it belong to me no but what god has given me am i using that grace and turn this place into a place where people can come and study the word at the same time they can come and live in this house now there were other issues over here which we did not could not solve the problem so there were different people who came like xavier came georgie came others came and each one a specialist about some things which they said why not we do this and this and this and a problem can be sorted out so this could have been done one year back uh, from how long we are here one year we could have done one year back but we did not have the solution we had the desire but we did not have the solution and now somebody said i know it now those who have come before the voice that you hear now on the speaker is it different from before previously we had to keep it so low that the voice should not go out so that people outside should not get disturbed now if you see the sound is not even going outside the door even when you are down the sound is not coming so somebody comes and says we can solve this problem somebody else comes and says we can solve this problem so our life is full of problems and the solution to all our life is inside the word of god so he's saying do you not know that many of us were baptized into jesus christ were baptized into his death in other words he's saying don't you know when you got baptized you are in union with christ so you and christ were one when he bled you also bled when he suffered you also suffered when he died you also died with him he is saying we were baptized into jesus christ he did not say we were baptized into water and we were baptized into his so don't you know don't you know uh, you know savi i understand she got so engrossed in the teaching that she forgot what she supposed to do it's okay i love that i really love that because she found that this is more important for me than anything else praise god hallelujah so therefore we are buried with him so yesterday i asked people how many of you have been to jerusalem you remember how many of you have been to jerusalem here only juliet which you i'm not asking you you are dangerous <laughs> You'll give me a dangerous answer. 
When did you go to Jerusalem? Now I'll ask her, listen to a dangerous answer. Yeah, when did you go to Jerusalem? Now you said 1999-2000. Now let me ask her, when did you go to Jerusalem? <laughs> huh? <2006. Arre. laughs> this was a googly wall. <laughs> I, thought, I thought she would give me. Ah, ah. So you are giving me two. In the natural, 2014. And in the spiritual, when Jesus died, 2000 years plus, she's saying, I've been with Jesus in Jerusalem. So when he died, I died with him. So she's giving me both the answers. You decide which world you want. If you want from the world news, 2014. If you want from heaven's news, I, I died with Christ. My God, still you put a googly for me. Hallelujah. So, therefore we are buried by baptism into death, like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. So, we died, and we died and we were buried. Do they bury a living man or a dead man? Who said living man? Dead man. So is that a proof that Jesus really died? That's why he was buried. So when he was buried, we were buried? With him or without him? So where's your tomb? In Jerusalem. Now, now when, we, when we read a passage like this, is it easy for us to believe? That you died? But if you ask the Holy Spirit to give you understanding, he says, just as Adam's disobedience made you a sinner, in the same way, Jesus died your disobedience. Because when he died your disobedience, your old nature died with you. When a man dies of COVID, what happens to COVID? What happens to cancer? So our old nature or our sin nature died with Christ. But the good news is after three days when Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, not by the word, we were, God created everything by his word, but when it came to resurrection he did not speak his word, but he raised Jesus from the dead by his glory. Even so, we also So, are you an old person or a new person? Just give me the AMPC. We were buried therefore with him by the baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, we too might, might, so do we have a new habit or the old habit? So, we have a new habit, we live and behave in the newness of life. So, are we called to learn to live in the newness of life? Amen? Hallelujah. And then the fifth one. For if we have become one with him by sharing a death like his, we shall also be one with him in sharing his resurrection by a new life. So in this new life, are we learning that from now on, our desire is God and the things of God and we live for God. Normally a lady lives for whom? Children comes first or spouse comes first? (laughs) 
When you have to make a choice between a spouse and a children, which one? See? And the, and the male, husband lives for whom? So now that you got a new life, for whom are you living for? So in our everyday life, who are you living for? Christ? Or for your old desires, old life? See, see, let me put it this way. If I live for Christ, Will Christ teach me to live a selfish life? No. What will he teach me? Selfless. selfless life. So if I'm living for Christ, how will be my attitude towards others? How will be my attitude towards my spouse? To my children? If I live for Christ. Will it be selfish? Or will it be selfless? Will it be corrupted? Now, for example, the husband is demanding from the wife. Is the wife perfect? No. So can he get a perfect response from his wife? No. Now, the wife is demanding something from her husband. Is the husband perfect? So can she get any perfect response from the husband? So, as she said, there was a fight before. Now, does that mean she's become perfect? Does that mean her husband has become perfect? There is a difference of opinion. But now, both are living for Christ. So if you're living for Christ, did Christ live for himself? Or did he give his life for others? So now as a wife, is she living to fulfill her desire? Or is she living to fulfill a spouse's desire? I'll tell you, if my wife has to decide that she wants to live a life to fulfill her desire, I can never go out. She said, where are you going? First there were two babies, they were in the nest. I had some time pass. Now both the babies have gone and built their own nest. What do I do sitting at home the whole day? Now is she interested in her life? Or is she interested in God's life? So God's life will make her selfish or she will be ready to send me out to do God's job. Are you understanding? Because we are imperfect, we cannot get imperfect response. But we have the third person in the marriage circle, and that is Christ who is perfect. So she is longing for love. Now can she get perfect love from me? But can she get the perfect love from Christ? And because she gets the perfect love from Christ, is she going to demand love or is she going to give love? So a person who is living in perfect love from Christ, will he be a giver or a taker? And when you don't have the love of Christ, will you be a giver or a taker? Where is the big problem? Giver or taker? Most of the time we are what? That's why the problem. So from the time you start giving, because now no human being is your source. The only source you got is Christ. If these bills are being paid, Christ is the source. If the health is there, Christ is the source. If this peace is there, Christ is the source. So the source for every area of your life is Christ. And when that becomes your focus, now 
you are not looking at anybody who is going to come and give me. Now you are saying, what I got, let me give to make somebody's life beautiful. And when you empty to give somebody's life beautiful, a stranger can come. I don't know who can come. But God, who is the source, can bring any person from any part of the planet and come and bless you. So when you look at the source, it is so enjoying because every day you don't know where your help comes from. But one thing, because he is my source, my help comes from God. He is my source. But the source has got plenty of channels. So I will never say this channel is my source. The channel is only because the source has directed the channel to come and help me. Is that clear? Hello? What's number six? And that this is what we got to learn. This is a very, very, very important word to live a victorious life. Knowing. What is knowing? What is knowing? What did she say? As long as I did not know, I was suffering for more than one and a half year until I came to know in part, until I came to know in part the authority and the power that I have in Christ Jesus. And when I came to know, I began to use what I began to know and my life became completely changed. The situation that was ruling over me and I was a slave to that situation, everything changed because I came to know. So do I need to know? And what do you need to know? Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. When did the old man got crucified? Now this old man is not on the 31st of December, okay? Because I'm in Goa, I know. You Goans have an old man. That at midnight you burn the old man. I'm not talking about that old man. I'm talking about the old man nature that I got from Christ. And because I died, and Christ died, we died both together. Praise God. The old man that came from Adam died with him, crucified on the cross. That the body of sin, body of sin, do you have a body? Is the body of sin? Why is it called body of sin? So we'll cut off your flesh? <laughs> Where are your five senses? Believe me, she'll never get angry with me. Are you angry with me? Are you angry with me? No. She loves me. Okay. Now tell me, in your body, are the five senses. No? Where is your eye? We you got eyes? Your eyes is in your body or in your soul? In the body. So your eyes are communicating and giving messages to the soul. Now if you put your finger in a hot boiling water, now what did the body say? Don't touch it. So my body is all the time communicating to me, to my senses, to my soul. So who is craving for worldly things? The body. Who is looking for gold? Who is looking for brass? <laughs> Both are gold, golden color. And brass is so heavy. 
value ho gaye hai so so who is giving you this craving the body so the body is all the time interested in the worldly things at the same time before i met jesus there was nothing to fight back because my soul was controlled by my body but the day the gospel got preached and i came to know that christ is my substitute and he died for me and when he rose from the dead i too rose from the dead not the same but he gave me a spirit and that spirit is now my connector to the holy spirit and my connector to god so now i got a, a connector called spirit who is talking to me the things of god and i have got a body which is all the time talking to me about selfish things are you understanding up till here so now that i know that the old man before it was crucified it used my body for selfish thing but now that i know that the old man got crucified he has no more control over my body of sin now that sinful activities in my body might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin so there was a time when this body was craving for things in the club in the gangs in all that but now when i realized that the old nature got crucified and god gave me a new nature and that is connected to my spirit so my body which was craving now the spirit is getting stronger and stronger with my with the with the teachings of christ now my soul or my mind has got three things it can think it can feel and it can choose so my body is giving me communication to think feel and choose at the same time my spirit that is connected to the word of god is also giving me communication to think feel and choose but all the three both of them are opposite to each other and here is the mind which is having a war should i go with my body or should i go with my spirit if i go with my spirit then this body is used only for godly things but the very next moment just a fraction of a second i change my thinking and i go into the flesh the same body which was used for pure holy things godly things will now be used by the old man for sinful things so i need to know that this old man who was a dictator inside of me has been put to death when crash died having been put to death now i have been given a spirit and this spirit is made righteous not by my works but by christ when he rose again he gave me his mind and that's why i now have the mind of christ and the mind of soul the mind of christ is all the time talking to me about the kingdom of god the mind of soul is always talking to me the things of the world and the mind of the world that mind has power over my body so the mind of christ is now bombarding me with godly things that i learned from the scriptures and i'm going on learning and learning and learning so it's giving me grace and it's giving me faith now the same body which was used for sinful purpose that same body is now being used for godly purpose
So, can I take a holiday? Can I take a break? I got to keep walking in the spirit. I cannot even take a small time to rest. Because the time of rest would be that I'm giving my flesh enough room to get into an attack. So can a Christian have time of holiday? Well, that holiday will be a very dangerous holiday. Praise God. Hallelujah. When I was young, I would always tell my wife, I will retire by 45 and I will go to Hawaii and spend my time in Hawaii. For what reason? For sin reason. My life, my earning, my money and all that. And after I got changed, God took me to Hawaii. And I had a Sunday which was a holiday. And we had a conference, so some went sightseeing, some went to, to go underwater, under the sea. What do you call scuba diving? Some went to see the volcano, some went there. And they asked me, where are you going? I said, I don't know. But I'm not coming with you all. And I went in search of drug addicts and I got one. And he, we became friends and I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to clean a garage. So I said, even I'm coming. I can help you. So he said, I'm not going to give you the money. I said, I don't want the money, but I can help you. So we went to a house where this lady was a Jehovah witness. And she asked him, where do you get this man from? He said, I just met him now. So why did he come? He said, he's coming to help me. So you mean to say you're going to charge me? He said, no. He said, I'm going to work for you free. So here we are lifting up the boxes and cleaning up the garage and we are sweating. And I said, I won't charge you. After everything is over, I said, let's go for lunch. He said, I'm not going to spend money for lunch. He is in drugs. So he wants every money. I said, can, we, can I buy lunch for you? So we both had lunch. Then I said, can you drop me again and let's have some meeting in the evening with your gang. Can you arrange that? He said, surely. So we had lunch together. I went to the hotel where I was staying. Got, had bath, got dressed up. And he came at that time and we went and we spent time with his gang. And we were speaking to him. And I began to share my story, how God brought me out of my trouble. Okay. And I shared with them how the word of God helped me. And they were listening to me for more than about two hours. And suddenly I looked at the watch. The watch said, the dinner was at 7.30. And I would have been about three kilometers from my place. Okay. So I said, you all can continue and I'll go. And I will tell you, I was running back to the hotel. And when I was running, the Lord said, I gave you the whole day holiday. Nobody knew where you would go. You are in Hawaii. Your dream that you wanted to be in Hawaii to enjoy sin and pleasure. Why you did not go? And I began to cry, running, tears rolling down and saying, God, thank you for this life. Thank you so much. Now, this time, in this year, I'm going back to Hawaii. And I've got fixed for three days in Hawaii for a retreat. See? And for me, Hawaii has become an important place because it reminds me that he cancelled those desires and gave me new desires. And from Hawaii, I would have come back to India. I found a flight that goes from Hawaii non-stop to Melbourne. So, I used to go halfway and then come back again. So, I found Jetstar flying from Hawaii to Melbourne. So I'm not going, coming back. I'm taking a whole circle around the globe and coming back in December. And this would be my first trip to go full circle 
at the time we'll go half circle, come back, and then I will go the other side half circle. What I'm trying to say is, when you know the old dictator has been put to death, now you have a savior who is there to save you and give you his righteousness, his power, his authority over that dictator that you can put him to death and keep him dead, crucified, so that the same body can be used for the kingdom of God. Those who are watching, we are having a new place in Jaknimal. Jak Yeah, like okay, even though it's going afterwards, praise God. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. So we got a new place in Jatniman. And praise God, it is on Saturday, starting from Saturday. So I'll be coming from Solapur. I might reach at around 10 o'clock, I think, at Kadamba. Bus is bringing me. And then I will be going to Mar. Mar Machoda and go up till 3 o'clock or 2.30 and then run to go to Jagniman to continue the lesson till 7 o'clock. So what is this body thinking the whole day? What is this body thinking the whole day? How can this body be used day and night so that more and more souls can be saved. Was I like this? No. I was entirely different. But who changed me? I never changed myself because I cannot change myself with my willpower. He changed me by coming into my life and destroying the sin nature and giving me his nature. So write down. As grace abounds, righteousness will also abound. That Imputed righteousness, imputed, that free gift righteousness will become imparted and practical righteousness in our lives. that we will live day by day week by week and year by year in victory day by day week by week and year by year in victory let me give you a practical example Let's say you came for the first retreat of your life and you were there for 10 days. When you came the first day, you did not want to sit, you wanted to go run away from there. Second day, you wanted to run even more. But it might be on the third day, you began to give your mind little and the fourth day, it became interesting. Fifth day became more and more interesting. By the 10th day, you are on, God, give me more. I don't want to go back home. I want to stay here. Did it happen? Hello? And then you left this place and you were going home. You just came out of the retreat house. 
and he went to buy a ticket. This happened to me. He went to buy a train ticket. And there was a lady standing in front of you. She also was going for a ticket. And when you were standing, she took one step back and she stood there and the pointed tube heel not poked, pressed your shoe that it was But silence her. <laughs> and then she realized that imbalance and she looked at you and she said, sorry. And what did you do? You just came from the retreat, no? Now were you a godly man? Now were you a godly man because you are loaded with godly things? Did you even curse her? It's okay. And when you went home, you found your feet was bleeding with that pointed <coughs> tube, heel. Now when you were looking at that, did you remember that woman for a, at least a week? How many times did you curse? <coughs> what I learned was, if on that day I could live a victorious life for that one day, because I got the new nature of God and my mind was full of what happened. Can I repeat the same thing the next day? If I got victory over oh my club life for one day, can I repeat the same the next day? So did I get victory by my strength or did I get victory by spending more time on the teaching? So now I found out that instead of me fighting back that I will not go to the club, I found that more and more I study the word, I don't even get the thought of going to the club. So it became one day, slowly, slowly it became one week, it became one month, and from the day I went for the retreat till today, I never stepped there. I did not even go to take my deposit. Because I found even the refund of that money is not going to be clean. I did not even want to have that money. Are, are you following what I am saying? Yeah. So once you taste that righteousness and practice it for one day, just one day, can you do the same thing repeatedly on the second day? Can you do it for one week? Yes. So now you are slowly but surely learning to get a new habit. So you are not doing it with your old style, but now you are knowing that I can be free from this dictator not with my willpower, but I can surely be free from this dictator by studying more and more and spending more and more time with my Savior, Jesus Christ. So right now, we got to know our identification with Jesus who gave himself for us. Identification with Jesus who gave himself for us. Romans 6 verse 6 to 7. So what's your identification? What's your identification? Yeah, what is your identification? Huh? 
How did the chunni start moving? How did the chunni start moving? Yeah, yeah. So I raised the hand. Did the chunni go up? So were we in Christ when Christ was crucified? So what's my identity? That I am in Christ or I am outside Christ? So, <laughs> so the King of King, that is Christ, came to serve or to be served? Normally the King comes to serve or he wants to be served by his people. But what about this King? So now, are we serving him or he in us is serving us? So who is the servant? He is the king. But he says, I want to be a servant to you that I will serve you. So by his service, does he give me freedom from my from that dictator who has made me a slave all these years. So through his service, can I get victory? So when I get victory, is the king saying now, that just as I served you, would you now love to serve others? Come on. So, are you now stepping out in faith to serve others? Now, will you go and serve others? No. No, you can't do that. The same king who served you is saying, you can use your body and serve others, but remember, you will not do. I, the king who is serving you, I will serve others through you. So, if we are standing here and serving you, can we take a credit that we served you? No. So can you take a credit that I prayed and you got healed? No. That I prayed and you were free from depression? Because I got to understand that I'm not the one, but Christ in me is my identity who is doing all the service and it looks from outside that it is me, but it's not me. So if I'm coming and spending time with you and talking to you, is it me talking to you or Christ in me is talking to you? Is that clear? So can you tell the king I want to serve you? He is saying, listen, if you want to serve me, are you perfect to serve a perfect God? Hello, am I perfect to serve him? Yes. I myself is imperfect. Can I imperfect serve the perfect? So he's saying, let's make the change. I am perfect and you are imperfect. But when I come and serve you, your imperfection I'll remove and lead you to perfection. And the more and more you get into perfection, every day you are growing stronger and stronger. I will use now your body, your witness, your lifestyle, to touch others and serve them as well. Wow! So can you ever believe an imperfect being used in the kingdom of God? Normally when there's an interview, who do they want to take? The best or the, the least? And when it comes to God's kingdom, what is he saying? You're the weakest, you're selected, come. You're, you're empty, wow! I can use you more. If you are full of yourself, I cannot help you. I cannot use you because you are full already. But if you are empty, then I don't need to make you empty to fill me. Wow. So what's your identity? In yourself or in Christ? So can you take any credit or boast of anything? But can you boast of God who is in you, working for you, with you, in you, and through you? 
Now are you going to enjoy their life? That's what is the addiction. But when your identity is with yourself, you are proud, you are ego, you are jealous, you got so many other activities. Yeah. Hey, just, 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 just. Because when you said, okay to boast, I said, this cannot be going without a recording. <laughs> because when you are talking about boasting, we better take in recording. Yeah. Brother, it's okay to boast for your God. For your God. If you boast. If you boast. For your God. It means for boast your, of what? Boasting like, okay, uh, he's my God. He's my savior. He's my everything. You, you need to boast it? Will, will people be attracted by your boasting? Or will they be attracted by your humility? The world wants you to be boasting. But a person is humble. God gives him with the grace. And God doesn't fight against you. But God will fight for you. But if you are boasting and you are proud, then the devil is not fighting against you. Your own God is fighting against you. Did you know that? God doesn't like pride. Huh? God doesn't like pride. He fights against pride. Why does he fight against pride? When you are saying, devil, get behind me, the Lord will say, it's not the devil, it's me. I'm fighting against your pride. Why? Why does God fight against pride? Because if he does not fight, that pride will take you to hell. And he doesn't want you to go to hell. So he's going to fight that pride till you come out of pride and now you can make it to heaven. And that's why when you are humble, God will give you grace. So when there is a fight, the question is, are you going to take the position of humble? Are you going to get into the fight and show who you are? But the more you become humble, what happens? God will give you the grace and multiply the grace and he will lift you up. Was Joseph a humble person compared to his brother's uh, uh, actions? Did he retaliate? Even once? So who fought for him? What if Joseph was also a retaliation? Now will God fight for him or will God fight against him? If you are boastful, let your boastful be in the action of love. Okay, let me put it this way, boastful. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Did God use a lamp or a lion? Sorry. To, to fight, to fight against the kingdom of darkness. Did God put a lamp or a lion to fight against the kingdom of darkness? Lamp. So what makes you think lion is going to win? So when you look at the lamb, everybody will say, he is harmless. He, he, they even instigated him, come on, come on, use your power. Did he use the power? Did he have? Yes. Did he use? No. Did he fight as a lamb or as a lion? But when he's coming back again, is he coming as a lion? Yes. But this is a time of mercy. But when he's coming back, the time of mercy is over. So how are you going to win this match in this world? As a lion or a lamb? But which one do we like to practice? 
Ask your neighbor, when was the last time you became a lion? How many years back? <laughs> and now ask the person, when did you become a lamb? Praise God. Praise God. Write down. We are in Christ. First point, Christ has acted on our behalf. Christ has acted on our behalf. Point number two, Christ is our representative. Christ is our representative. You must always remember that Christ is your representative. Don't ever forget that. Was Adam our representative? Hey, in the past, before we met Jesus, he was by default our representative that whatever came, came from Adam. So because he was our representative, by default, Everything that he received came to us by default. For example, husband and wife are HIV and the baby gets HIV. Now was it the baby's mistake? The baby inherited because the mother and father were HIV. In the same way, we inherited from Adam the sin nature. Are you following? So when I say that Jesus is my representative, then I'm saying I was born of Adam, but I'm no longer born of Adam and banish Eve. But now, Christ is my representative and whatever is in Christ I receive like whatever was in Adam I received in the old before my rebirth. So did God create us sinners? No. He created us in his likeness and image. But what Adam did changed the nature of man from likeness and image of God to sin nature, likeness and image of Satan. Are you following? So when I say that Jesus is my representative, that means every action of Jesus I receive as an inheritance and everything of mine he receives as a representative, as a substitute for me. Praise God. Clear? Third, what happened to the Lord Jesus? What happened to the Lord Jesus happened to us? What happened to the Lord Jesus happened to us because we were baptized in him and that is why whatever he suffered, we suffered with him. Did we deserve that suffering? Yes. But did he take it on himself? Yes. But we were in him and therefore it affected us as well. So when he died, we died. When he was buried, we buried. And when he was raised from the dead, we too were raised from the dead because we were never separated. Fourth, he chose to be one with us. He chose to be one with us. Who chose whom first? Who loved whom first? So, did he have to choose us? We were his rebel. 
we were his opponent, we were his enemies. But because of love, he stole, chose us. So was it necessary for him to leave heaven, empty himself of glory, and take a body from a woman, live on this earth, be tempted in all, every way that we are tempted, and still walk without sin, suffer for us, die for us, take all the insult and abuse, and all the bleeding, did he have to choose that? Was it a force? Or was it love? Praise God. So his love, he chose to be one of us. Now, we know that God is a spirit. When Jesus took that body, he was a spirit being, God. Now, when he adapted that body from a supreme with a body, he became extremely low with a body. Now, after his death, is he still in a body? No. He's still in a body. Huh? No, I never. Huh? When he rose again, did he have a body? Hello, when he rose from the dead, did he have a body? Did he eat fish? Did he pass through the walls? So he had a body. Now imagine for God, who is a spirit, would live in the body forever. What would his body remind him? Of his love for us. How many of us from a supreme level would take a body and live in that body forever? And Jesus took that body so that he become one with us and live in that body forever. And that body would remind him of his love for each one of us. Praise God. Right on. Is it interesting? Yes. Is it helping us to know the truths? Yes. Right on. When Jesus came to this earth, when Jesus came to this earth and suffered, bled and died, We suffered, bled and died with him. Because he died for us. <coughs> Romans 6, 6 and 7 says, When Jesus died, he died for us as our substitute. He died for us as our substitute. When Jesus died for us, We died with him. So my question to you is, when Jesus was scourged at the pillar, who took the lashes? You? Or Jesus. But were we in Christ? (coughs) 
was the lashes for him or for us? But did he take it? So having paid the penalty, do we now need to take those lashes? He took it as a substitute, as a representative to set us free. And that is why our Christian life is to know what he did for us and that is why our identity is not us but our identity is we in him. Amen? So please read Galatians 2.20. Hmm? Yeah, I'm crucified, yeah. I am crucified with? So if I pinch you and you're dead, will it hurt you? No, because you're dead. So are you really crucified with Christ? that if somebody said something, you react so quickly. She did this to me, he said this to me. So are you crucified with Christ in words? Are you really crucified with Christ in believing? Are you understanding what I'm saying? So are you really crucified with Christ? You know the scripture. No doubt. So when somebody is saying something, are you saying, I'm not going to crucify, I'm not going to react, because I'm already dead. So are we really crucified with Christ? Do we believe that? Then why do you get insulted? Why do you get in offended? Have you ever seen a dead body getting offended and, and turning and saying, I will not talk to you? Imagine the dead body opening his mouth and saying, I don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> what happens to the others who are alive? Many of them have gone dead, heart attack. What is Paul saying? I am crucified with Christ. Means what? All these circumstances, all these things that are coming against me, they have no power to play on my emotions anymore because I am dead to it. Because all those insults and all those abuses that you are directing to me, it's never going to touch me because in between you and me, Christ is the one who has taken all that on my behalf. So are we really believing I'm crucified with Christ? And if I'm really crucified with Christ, I'm dead. Do dead have emotions and feelings? Do dead get stressed out and angry and bitter? And that's what Paul says. I have experienced a life which I never knew before, but having experienced Christ in me, who died for me, I've learned now that my old nature, which was getting irritated, has changed now, because I find myself crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Listen. I'm crucified with Christ, but that doesn't mean I'm a dead body. My body is still alive. But my body does not have power to control my emotions, but my spirit is the one who is teaching me to live a victorious life. And the life that I'm living is not I, but Christ lives in me. So. 
there's a battle that my old self wants to sit on the throne of my heart. So that when he sits on the throne, he can rule my life. Who? My old self. But at the same time, my heart also, my Christ also wants to sit on the throne of my heart. So whom am I going to give the position? My flesh or my heart? So if I get give the flesh my heart, then Jesus is still on the cross. But if I give Jesus the throne to sit on my heart, then Jesus is on the throne and myself is on the cross. Which one is better? Self crucified on the cross or Jesus crucified on the cross? So every blunders that we do, you must ask yourself, is Christ on the throne or flesh on the throne? If flesh on the, is on the throne, I'm ruled by a dictator who makes me a slave and uses my body as a slave and makes me do the things that I hate to do. I end up becoming a slave. So I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not in my old nature. Yet not I live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, that is in my body of flesh and blood, I live, go slowly, I live by the faith, by the faith of or in. He never said by the faith in the Son of God. Some Bibles still have translation of in, but the King James is saying of. What's the difference between in and of? I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by faith in the Son of God. What's the difference? Which one is greater? So what faith are you living on? The same faith that Jesus lived on this earth, that same faith has been imparted to each one of us. Then the question comes, if that faith has been imparted, how come I'm not experiencing that faith? I'm not yet experiencing that faith because in my everyday life, I'm still learning to die to myself. So the more and more the self is crucified, the more and more all that forgiveness and forgiveness, uh, forgiveness, fog, fog, is removed and the clarity becomes very clear. So even though I'm in Christ, even though I have the authority of Christ, even though I believe in Christ, even though I love Christ, my life is still not showing the fruit of righteousness. Why? Because my thinking is still covered with fog. So everyday battle is what? To win or to crucify flesh? Everyday battle is to get blessing or to crucify flesh. So where's my victory? In getting favor of God or to crucify my flesh? Because if my flesh is alive, then I cannot live in the newness of life because my flesh is ruling over my life. And that's what Paul is saying. I've learned 
that even though I live in this body, this body has no power to dictate terms with me because I've learned to crucify the desires of the flesh so that those desires of the flesh have no control over this body. This body has become selfless, controlled by Christ who is sitting right now on the throne of my heart, ruling over this body, directing this body, leading and guiding this body in the way it should live. So I've got a choice. The choice is, I can live in the flesh and use this body and I can live in the spirit and use this body. And this body can be shifted any moment in a fraction of a second. But if I make it a habit of keeping my self crucified, then Jesus has ownership over my body and he uses my body for righteous living. And that's the battle every day. The battle is not how much blessing you got, how much healing you got, how much power you got, how much possession you got, how much resources you got. The battle is what's your score of dying to flesh. So I live by the faith of the Son of God who so did he die to take advantage of me? Or did he lie to save me? And to save me there was only one way by giving himself for me. So what was the ransom money? He is my substitute. So he had to pay the ransom. So what was the ransom? His own blood. His, his own blood, his own life, everything given as a ransom for each one of us. So write down. According to Romans 6-7, Sin has been a taskmaster. Sin has been a taskmaster. It has been a dictator. It has been a dictator. We have the penalty. We have a penalty that has to be paid. That has to be paid. Our old master has been Satan. Our old master has been Satan. The flesh and the world but when we die our old master has been Satan the flesh and the world but when we die is not a master anymore but when we die is not a master anymore our sins have brought us our sins have brought us into jeopardy I'll explain to you 
J E O P A R D Y J E O P A R D Y but in Jesus we died we are crucified with Christ we were buried with Jesus Romans 6 3 to 4 when Jesus was buried we were buried with him the burial of Jesus the burial of Jesus is part of the gospel one corinthian 15 one corinthian 15 3 to 4 jesus carried our sins Jesus carried our sins to the grave to the grave of God's forgetfulness Satan would love to Satan would love to intimidate us intimidate us with the bones of our old life but our sins but our sins are in the grave but our sins are in the grave of God's forgetfulness of God's forgetfulness our old life is dead our old life is dead and Satan does not have any power over us put that Romans 6 7 please we'll have to do this topic over and over and over and over again to learn this topic over and over again so that it comes into our system let's read verse number 7 for he that is dead for he that is dead can a dead body have ungodly thoughts? Can a dead body have jealousy? Can a dead body have anything to do with sin? So, if I believe that I died with Christ, then everything that Satan had a claim on me is already over because I died with Christ now listen carefully if I had to die without Christ would that be very dangerous why would it be dangerous because the penalty is paid by Jesus but I have not completed the transaction of believing in Christ what he did and therefore 
I am found guilty. Sin has power over me. The dictator has power over me. And I become a candidate to go to hell. But when it comes to Jesus, Jesus died for me. He bled for me. And he died in my place. Now, why is it safe for me now that I'm not found guilty? Now, now, I've done something wrong. Do I need forgiveness to avoid hell? And who is, how can I get forgiveness when I've committed the blunder? So let's say you, you caused an accident to my car and you damaged my car. And I had to pay 10,000 for the damage. And you just came and said, sorry. First of all, you damaged my car. And now you're saying sorry. Should I let you go? You touch my car, I'll do no. So when do I get forgiven? Who is going to pay? So you damage my car and Jesus is going to pay? Nice shani you are. So when does a person get forgiveness? Hmm? Sorry? When it is paid fully. And who's going to make the payment of 10,000? I'll not allow you to go to Surat till you finish with the full payment. Even if your family calls up from there, Nahi chodega, pachas, das hajar plus interest. I hope you won't have sleepless night. So, Jesus gave a parable of that servant who was forgiven of 10,000 talents. Now when the king said, I forgive you, did he cancel his debt? Yes. So who made the payment? The king. the king made the payment. So what is forgiveness? The person who forgives pays the penalty. So did Jesus pay the penalty? Did he say, Father, forgive him, forgive them? What if Jesus had not bled? What if Jesus had not taken the punishment? Could Jesus say to the Father, forgive them? Then it would be illegal for God to forgive because he would be unjust. Somebody had to pay the penalty. So Jesus says, I take their place and I take the punishment on myself and I paid the penalty full. There is nothing lacking. So now, please Forgive them. So has Jesus paid the penalty? Now what happens when a person is brought back to the court for the same crime again and asked to pay the penalty? It can be done? No. So in the same way, what happened is Satan is saying, this man obeyed me and therefore he has to be punished. The judge says, you are right, I need to punish this man. But Jesus, the advocate, opens his mouth and says, listen, I was illegally punished for something that I did not know. I was accused with lies and I was put on the cross that did not belong to me, it belonged to him. And I, with my own love and will, have made the penalty complete and he has the receipt. So can a person be punished twice for the same crime? And that is called as, I don't know how do you spare, say that, jeopardy. 
you cannot punish the person twice for the same crime so if that person as somebody else got punished that then that same crime you cannot punish some the real person because it has already been paid so jesus paid on the cross and he said to his father forgive them what if jesus had not to say father forgive them but would have said bless them you could have got blessed but you could not have been forgiven and because jesus said the penalty has been paid by me now please forgive them is that clear or is that clear say so somebody comes and says please forgive me and you say okay i forgive you if there is no transaction of you paying the damage then that forgiveness is incomplete so the person who forgives pays the penalty so did jesus pay the penalty that's why we are forgiven and because jesus took a place hell got cancelled and heaven became my eternal home praise god so sin who was a dictator had power to really make a life miserable so when a person dies and he doesn't know christ and he refused to believe in christ he refused to accept christ you will never see that person again in eternity he himself has decided to spend the rest of his life in hell and that is why it is so important for us every day to use everything possible to proclaim the good news and get people into christ so that we can all make it to heaven so the moment the person has received jesus as his lord god and savior sin is no longer a dictator he has lost his ownership i'll give an example if you go to bombay if you go to bombay at mime there is a church called st michael's church okay on wednesday there is a st michael's novena and in the whole day there'll be more than 30000 people visiting that church continues there are novenas okay now supposing there is a hindu person who is going there for the last one year it's okay but one fine day he comes home and he says i just got baptized this wednesday why is there now hell at home why is there so much of fight at home this man was going to church every wednesday for one year and nobody was angry in his family how come now he says i got baptized and they asked what is baptism with the priest put water on my head so why are people getting angry ha huh? he has changed his identity because he has confessed before heaven and earth that jesus christ is my lord and when he says that satan has lost his ownership over that soul satan has no problem if you go to church he has no problem if you sit there but the moment you confess and believe that jesus christ is your lord is the savior of your soul now satan lost that soul and when he loses the soul he gets so annoyed that everywhere there is havoc in the family so do you see baptism has got such power that you can take a person from darkness into light by preaching the gospel helping him to believe in christ 
so that he is baptized in Christ and now sin has no power. Satan is no longer a dictator. He has lost that soul. Christ is the Lord of his life. Then we read, we have a penalty that has to be paid and our old master has been Satan, the flesh and the world. So if you got an old master, the old master will keep you a slave till the end. So even though in Christ you can inherit it, you can inherit the treasures of heaven, you never be able to taste it because you never knew that you this inheritance belongs to you. Now if imagine Jesus did everything. Okay? And now he's asking you only one question. Do you choose to believe that I died for you? You know what Jesus is saying? I did everything for you. Only one thing I need from your side. Can you believe what I did for you? And Satan makes us believe what we did in life. And Jesus is saying, I want you to believe what I did for you. Where is our focus more on? What you did or what Christ did? And that's why, even though Christ has done everything for us, we fail to experience what Christ has done because our focus is not on what Christ did. Our focus is always on what we did. And the lie keeps us in that bondage all our life to think about what we did. We read in the morning that God is not counting your sins. He has given you the ministry of reconciliation and not only that, God himself is appealing to us and through us that we can go and share this truth to the people. Amen. So, when we die, Satan is no longer a taskmaster because he has lost his ownership over us through our baptism in Christ. Our sins have brought us into jeopardy, but in Jesus we died. So what happened? Because of our sins, Jesus came to this earth to take our place as a substitute, as a representative, and he did all that he had to do. Praise God. Now the question is, do I believe? I'll give an, another example. Go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. I want you to be very attentive because this is where you lose the match. There are many, 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 many Christians who lose their match every day because they did not understand the truth. Now watch this. Revelation 12.10 I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now, Now, is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. When? Now. And the power of his Christ for for the accuser. Who is that? Satan. The accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before a God day and night. So what is Satan doing? Accusing us. Accusing us. What is he accusing of? Huh? About our disobedience. Whatever we did, he is accusing before God and saying, you are a just God. And this person has obeyed me. And he has disobeyed you. And because he has disobeyed you, this person deserves the penalty. And the penalty is hell. Eleven. 
and they were accused by Satan, they overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony, and they loved not their lives even unto death. Now, Satan is saying, this person obeyed me and disobeyed you. So Jesus is saying, hold on, I paid the penalty for this person and my blood has forgiven him of all charges. I paid the penalty completely. So the judge is looking at Satan and is looking at Jesus and he's saying, I'm not satisfied with both of you. Satan is saying, this person disobeyed you and that's why this person has to go to hell. Jesus is saying, I paid the penalty and I paid the price and therefore this person need not go to hell. And the judge says, I need two witnesses. Both of you are equal. So now, if Satan has to come and ask you, did you commit sin? What like that? <laughs> Have you committed sin, yes or no? Satan what? Sorry? You don't talk to Satan, you have to talk to the judge. I am Satan. I am Satan asking you, have you committed sin, yes or no? Have you committed sin? No? <laughs> All the recording is there. This is not the, this is not the court of this earth. Sab kya kya soch rahe sab hai. Nahi kya hai. Kholu kya. Yeah. Have you done? Now, Satan is asking these two. Have you done sin? Yes. You? Yes. yes. Now, judge is saying, no more to speak, condemn to death, go to hell. Because, because I told you I need two witness. Satan had one, his own words. Jesus had one, his own words. I asked, I am Satan and I'm accusing you. And I asked you, have you committed sin? And you said yes. Now I'm asking you, have you committed sin? I am asking you, have, yes or no? Yes, but Jesus has paid the No, yes or no, that's it. She got caught, she's, she's on the journey to hell. Now she's saying, say yes or no, because I want your company. <laughs> now tell me, yes or no? Yes, but Jesus has paid the penalty. Now, now, now what is she bearing witness? She's saying, yes, Satan, I have disobeyed you. I have disobeyed God and obeyed you. But it's not complete. I have witness that Jesus has paid the price by his blood. And that's why we overcame him, Satan, not only by the blood of the Lamb, but also... So what's your testimony? What you did, you have to acknowledge that. You can't tell lies. But at the same time, do you also need to testify what Jesus did? So you too, And she is saying yes, and you're saying, say yes, son. <laughs> and she's <laughs> say yes or no. And she's saying, yes, but I'm not yet complete. My testimony is not yet complete. My testimony is, I believe what Christ did for me, and therefore Satan, I agree with you, not completely, but I agree with Jesus, who paid the penalty for me and that's why I am forgiven. 
So every day in our life, what kind of confession do we do? What Satan, what we did for Satan, or what Christ did for us? But if you don't know the scripture, how will you know? Praise God. So we must learn that we are crucified with Christ, we are buried with Christ, and when Jesus was buried, we were buried with him. And what is the gospel? What is the good news? Huh? What is the good news? Hey, what is the good news? Sorry? You, how can you be raised when you were not dead? <laughs> so you got to be sure that what would your confession be? I was crucified with Christ. So when Christ died, I died with him. When Christ was buried, I was buried with him. And the advantage of me that I was buried with him the case which was against me for the crime that he did and when they saw that I'm dead, the case got dismissed. Do they still run the case of a person who's dead? No. So when the person is found dead, the case is dismissed. And now, I thank God after that, I rose from the dead with a new spirit. I am now a new creature. My old stuff got buried and now I am with the new stuff of righteousness and that is my testimony. Is life and death in the power of your tongue? So are you confessing that you have risen from the dead with a new nature, new spirit, new power? And that's so important. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Just give him the mic. Can I say that uh, I believe that Jesus paid the price for my sins without actually repenting. I cannot say that. No, no, I, I have not yet finished. I, the first is your identity. Yes. See, verse number 11. There are three, go to Romans 6. That's a good question. In 6.6, 6, the key word is in 6.11 What is the word reckon? Consider. Likewise reckon you also yourself to be dead. Do I consider myself dead into sin? Yes. And that's your, rep that's your repentance. Exactly. Okay, two. Reckon. Go down. Third one is in third. We are going to come to that as we study tomorrow. Yeah. So three words to live a victorious life. Know that you are dead to your old life. Two, reckon that you have got righteousness. And three, yield the members of your body which were once upon a time connected to unrighteousness, now you yield yourself unto God. So when you put all these three words together every day, moment by moment, you start living a victorious life. Yeah, so... Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. So, go ahead, go ahead. I'm not yet finished. Yeah, tell me. So, the biggest evidence of me being saved is living a sinless life, right? We won't be living a sinless life because we will not be 
attaining perfection. Okay. But what life I was living before, yes. it will be a total change on the journey every day. And if I'm learning every day, then surely I will not be what I used to be one last week. Yes. So it's a whole process of learning. And in this learning, there's a process of repentance. Yes. So the level to which I learn to repent, yes. then I will operate in the faith of Christ. Correct. But if I'm not repenting, but I'm saying I'm saved. Yes. What is the proof that you're saved? Correct. You're still living the old life. Exactly. So the very thing that I'm saved is that I am all the time longing to learn. Yes. So I'm learning on one side, Christ life. On the other side, I'm unlearning all that I'd learned in the world, which has led me into destruction. Correct. So then when we talk about the scripture, uh, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It is the walk in the spirit part that includes the dying to flesh. Right? Yeah, yeah. See, when, when you begin to grow in the spirit, one is growing, yeah, the other dying. one is dying. Correct. But you cannot put death to the flesh with your own strength because the flesh is stronger than you are. Yes. But now that you have the I mind know. of Christ, so, so now, with Christ's power, you are yielding yourself to His power that is teaching you to put to death to your old life. So one, is, one can try to do it, or if I say, stop fulfilling the lust of the flesh, that would be law. Correct. That would be legal. Legalism. And in legalism, you will never succeed because you don't have the power to put it to death. But now when God is saying, you walk in the spirit, and we learned that there are two legs to walk. The first leg is repentance. So you are bringing your mind, aligning to what God says. So there is learning. And two, whatever you are learning, you are practicing in faith. Because the whole kingdom of God operates in faith. What is that faith? I don't have physical evidence. But I surely have evidence from the word of God and that is from the creator. So I choose to believe what the creator said and not what the world is saying or whoever is saying I choose to believe what God is saying. So then, shouldn't, uh, how can I say I have repented if I do not believe? Sorry? How can I say I have repented if I do not believe? You cannot repent without learning the truth. Yeah, yeah but I'm saying that. How can I say my repentance is complete without believing? Like, I'm asking why are they two steps, basically? I feel, according to me, like out of my understanding, Changing to the new higher thinking involves believing. Okay. Now, when I'm repenting, yeah. am I repenting through the promise of God? Yes. Now, when I'm operating in faith, can I have faith without believing? Can I have faith without believing? No. Yeah. That's why, one is the promise of God that is changing my thinking. And two is, my faith, which is believing in the new thinking. Let me give you an example. When the Lord taught me mathematics in the kingdom of God, years back, when I did not have anything, He taught me 10 minus 7 is 700, which I never learned in any school. So it was absolutely a new teaching for me at that time, 10 minus 7 is 700. Okay. But when I began to renew my mind in repenting and practicing it with faith, 26 years, it has been paying all my bills. 
So you're saying repentance is gaining the knowledge and then faith is putting the knowledge into action? Yes. I see. Okay. Say that again. Repentance is gaining the knowledge and believing. Gaining the knowledge from the promise of God. Yes. And faith is putting that you agreeing and putting your corresponding action. Okay. So who are the people who are growing? Those who put it into action. Those who are learning every day. See, your action will be against self-effort. Please understand the difference between the two. I can put the action right, but it can be without Christ. That will burn me out. Yeah. So, what will stop you from being burnt out? The promise. Is your learning. Yes. yes. So, when you are learning, your mind is getting renewed, not with your power, but with Christ's power. So now you are enjoying to practice faith because it's no longer you who is doing but he is the one who is prompting you, he is the one who is leading you, he is the one who is guiding you. So now your mathematics is not how much did I win? It's not your looking at your scoreboard how much am I going to get? Your scoreboard is how much can I use to get somebody in the kingdom. Is there a big difference? Yes. So now you are enjoying. Yeah. Even though you are spending, you are still enjoying. Yes. And then comes in the mind, what about how am I going to pay the expenses? Again your mind is saying, he is the source, he is going to do it for you. Yeah. And the beautiful part is, when you don't know from where the bills will come, Bills will be paid and they get paid every month. So when we were having this international retreat, I know the cost is very high. Because all facilities are given. So if I sit and total up, I will say, hey, can we shift it to some other season? But at the same time, when we say yes to God and you are putting your whole heart to what he said and you are practicing, now you will see that everything is taken care, not only that, there will be even more for the next retreat. Yes. So I am working on some new projects in Jharkhand and in Ranchi. And all this is going to be again free. But I do know that all these projects will work by the power of God and not with our willpower. And the joy is when everything is taken care by the Spirit of God and you did not even sweat for it. You don't even know which person at what time, in what season will come suddenly and help you to finish the project. That's the beautiful joy. And that's what the kingdom of God says. The, the man went and scattered the seed and then he went to sleep and then he got up at night. But the seed sprouted and was growing and there he says, he does not know how. If you are interested in knowing how, you will get burnt out. <laughs> if you don't ask the question how, and you believe, now the flesh will get burnt out. But somebody will get burnt out. Clear? Yes. So when we come back, what time we close for dinner? Oh, now, now, the, now the timings have changed? Wow. Thanks, Georgie. No, no, I'm saying thank you to you because of the things that you fixed. Now we can even have the whole night vigil. <laughs> See, one person's solution has changed everything over here. Praise God. So, can we have dinner and come back so we can go? Till midnight? 
not yet cooked? Ten minutes. Okay, ten minutes. Brother, one more question. So yeah. when you when we learnt like uh, when God forgives forgives us, He remembers us sins no more. So that's forgiving and forgetting. And if I believe I have the nature of God. No, no, you speak a little louder here, yeah, sweeter. Uh, if I okay, so the nature of God is forgive and forget, right? He remembers us sins no more. Now, if I believe I have the nature of God, anyone and anyone. Can you go slow? Okay. Your English is too fast for me. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the nature of God is, He will not remember my sins, and He has forgiven me completely, right? So He has forgiven, He has forgotten. If I, if I believe I have the nature of God, I'm called to do the same thing, right? I forgive and I forget. But then, and this has not happened in my life, so I don't know the solution to it, which is, if there is someone in my life who's exhausting my resources, right? I forgive that person, I forget, but he comes again to use those resources. How is it that I'm supposed to operate in this situation? So will I, you, will I give somebody to, first thing, other resources yours? No. Are you a good manager? Yes. So if somebody is wasting the resources, will you put a stop to it? Yes. So are you responsible to it? I am responsible to it. So you will stop that person? But God also says, to not, you, I need to forget. So if I sorry, I, 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 I see God says to forget. For example, uh, Psalm 103. What does He say? Bless the Lord, O my Bless soul, and forget not His benefits. Okay. Now is now is He not saying in Isaiah, remember not the things of long ago? Yes. And here He's saying, forget not. So how come the two scriptures are going opposite to each other? One is saying, do not remember. Another one is saying, do not forget. It's two different things, I guess. Remember and forget mean different so things. So he's saying, when it comes to the benefits of the things of the kingdom, don't forget, keep praising, keep thanking God for His goodness. But the things that have had bad things in your life, don't remember them. They are going to tear you apart. So, I can forgive you. But that does not mean I will forget what you did. I will remember that not to take action against you. I will remember that, that I do not give you the same chance to waste the resources again. But that doesn't mean I will reject you. Yes. I'll still help you being a good manager. Yes. Mm. Okay. Cool. So one scripture is saying, forget not his benefits. Now for example, what you wore, what you wore last Sunday, not this Sunday, what you wore last Sunday, can you remember? But can you remember what you wore on something special day? Yes. How many years back? You can remember. So that means I can choose what to remember. Now out of all the goodness that God has done, and there was me who came and did a nasty thing to you, which one do you choose to remember? Huh? It is our sorry, sorry. I don't, I didn't, huh? it is, it is hey, I did not know you have got the old nature now. No, no, it is our brain is structured, is what I'm saying. It, our brain is structured that way, that we remember. You, your, your brain was structured. Yeah, 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 I mean, the in, in our old nature, is that's what. Yeah, so now which one do you choose to remember? The good things. Yeah. So if you are remembering the good things, do you have any moment to remember the nasty things that have happened. No. So the whole day, what are you doing? Rejoicing. Praise, rejoicing in the Lord. Yeah. Like in the Garden of Eden, was there a garden full of trees? Yeah. All fruit-bearing trees? Yeah. Was there any lack? No. Why do you think the devil went and spoke about one tree? Disobedience. He wanted them to disobey. He got a focus of all the trees on that one tree. 
Why do you think the devil is hurting you so much? Because he wants you to focus on that one thing negative that has happened, so that once you focus there, he can surely get you into trouble. So instead of you focusing on that one thing, why don't you focus on the multiple things that God has done good to you? Yeah. So is there, is there going to be a time of bitterness? No. Praise God. And that's why he says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. How can Paul be in the prison, being dipped in a sewage, up to his chest level, and still say, Rejoice in the Lord always. So is he looking at his current situation or is he still looking at how good the Lord is? Are we looking at what Jesus finished on the cross or are we looking at what we lack in our life? What he finished on the cross qualifies us to go to heaven. So are you looking for temporary things of the world or are you looking at eternal things of heavenly treasures? Mm. So where's your heart on? Things of God. If it's on heavenly treasure, then it doesn't bother you, the treasures of this world. Yeah. Then day and night, you're, you're laboring to gather the treasures of heaven. And what is the treasures of heaven? Love. Love. Joy. Joy. Peace. Peace. Patience, gentleness, kindness, humility, self-control. And where do you gather this? In good times or in bad times? Bad times. When, when do you gather this? In a war zone or in a friendly zone? War zone. And do you have some war zone in your life? Congratulations. It's time to gather the treasure. Yeah. But if your treasure is of the world, then where are you focused on? Things of heaven or things of the world? Praise God. So can we just close our eyes and meditate on all that we studied today? And when we come back, we'll study on consider and yield the two more words that are so important for us to live a victorious life. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us through the scriptures that even though we heard this teaching, it will take more and more understanding that comes from you to soak ourselves in this truth. So that we are not drawn to the treasures of this world, but the treasures of your heavenly kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us that our victory is not the victory over the worldly things, but our victory is over ourselves. With our own choice, allowing those nails to go through the flesh and be crucified and stay crucified so that this body, which is of sin once upon a time, is no longer controlled by any dictatorship but is totally controlled by your spirit. Thank you Lord for teaching us that when a person is dead he is free from sin. Teach us to be dead in the flesh and remain dead in the flesh crucified with Christ so that we are free from every lust of the devil. Thank you that we give no room at all for the body to be used for carnal ways, but the same body to be used in the kingdom of God. Thank you for this wonderful truth that we live by faith and not by sight. 
Thank you for teaching us that repentance is so important to walk in the Spirit and every promise of God gives us opportunity to change our thinking. And as we exercise our faith to all that we are learning to repent and walk by faith and the faith also not in the faith in Christ Jesus but the faith of the Son of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you that we have this assurance that we have been given the same faith of the Son of God and as we meditate, believe and exercise and practice and train and develop a new habit, not only we will be victorious, but looking at a lifestyle, others also will be attracted to change their life. Thank you Lord for teaching us that we cannot get victory with our self-effort But every victory is possible through Christ Jesus. Thank you for teaching us this truth. And thank you that by your Spirit you are teaching us in practical life how to be winners over sin in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. So you can sit down for some time.